Hey guys, welcome to Pre-AP Biology Cell Communication 1.4. This is going to be part one. Well, you're going to have to pay attention here because this can get pretty complicated. It's not going to get as complicated as, as this diagram, but you still need to pay attention. All right, so the first question to ask, why do cells need to communicate? I mean, it's not like they're going to parties or anything, but they need to be able to utilize the resources of the cell, of the surrounding, of the organism efficiently uh, so that they don't waste resources and that it can use those resources for other things. What I mean by resources are things like nutrients and uh, oxygen and things of that nature. So several different ways cells can communicate. Number one is with direct contact. They touch each other and uh, through the extracellular matrix, uh, as the cells touch each other, they can communicate messages from one cell to the other by transmitting uh, vibrations down through various proteins and things of that nature that are on the cells. Another way that they can communicate is by using chemical messages. And these are both uh, can be local and long distance communication. Okay, local si signaling, as you can see over here on the uh, left hand side of this diagram, what we have is we have a cell that is secreting uh, messages and it's, as you see, secretory vesicles. Where is that coming from? That's coming from proteins that were made in the endoplasmic reticulum. And then those proteins went up through the Golgi apparatus and they were packaged into these little transport vesicles, these secretory vesicles, that then released these proteins out into the local environment where they will then attach to target cells and things of that nature to help regulate the organism. Okay, another form of local signaling happens at your nerve cells where you have a little gap between two neurons and when a nerve impulse comes down this long axon, it's going to cause the release of these transmitter molecules, which are also manufactured in the endoplasmic reticulum by the ribosomes that are attached there and then packaged in the Golgi apparatus. And then they're going to be released into the synaptic cleft, this little synapse. They will diffuse across the synapse and attach to receptor proteins and then cause a nerve signal to then go on to the next cell. The next way in which uh, cells can signal is through long distance. And this is a form of hormonal signaling where hormones are produced in one gland and they travel through the blood vessel till they reach the target cell. How do they know which cell to go to? They don't. At cells that are target cells have specific proteins on them. And these things fit kind of like a lock and key. These these uh, signal molecules will fit into a receptor protein in a way that then activates, uh, 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 causes a response in the ta target cell. And you have all sorts of these glands in your body, and we'll, spend, we'll talk some more about those in class. Now, other ways that signals can be transmitted over long, long distances, and I'm talking about it can be miles, uh, are things by pheromones, and these are uh, chemicals that are secreted by animals, and uh, they're released into the air, and uh, your dog marking its territory, in this case, on, such as this fire hydrant, it's a form of long-distance signaling, and dogs, and you know, dogs will like to come up, and they'll smell that fire hydrant, and they'll realize that another animal is there. Uh, insects use pheromones quite a bit, and we have, we, what I mean by we is we is uh, people who produce food have utilized these pheromones to basically trap insects, to create little pheromone traps that the insects fly into and prevents them from uh, destroying our food crops and things. So just to, re, just to re, uh, recap here, we have three types of signaling, direct, local, and long distance. Long distance can be broken down into hormones, which travel within the body, and pheromones, which travel outside of the body. 
And then, of course, uh, our local signals uh, do play a role in um, things like growth factors and the synapse of neurons and things of that nature. Now, the person responsible for kind of coming up with this whole signal transduction reception response type uh, scenario that we're going to be talking about was Earl Sutherland back in 1971 where he got the Nobel Prize for this. And he's kind of a local hero. He went to Vanderbilt University, and uh, it's a great university if you're interested in going uh, to into medicine or things of that nature. Uh, it's a great school. Got some friends up there that work there. Um, anyways, we're going to go into the signal transduction pathway. Now, the example we give you in your notes is that it's analogous to talking on the phone. And we all like to talk on the phone or text on the phone, however you like to communicate, or Snapchat or whatever. That is a type of communication. But Earl Sutherland basically broke this process down into three major steps. First step is reception. This, in our analogy of a telephone, would be like the telephone ringing. In the cell, it's a signal molecule, which is going to be transmitted either in the cytoplasm, or excuse me, either in the uh, cytosol or in the uh, bloodstream or something of that nature. But basically, it's a molecule that's going to attach to a receptor protein. And that's what this is right up here. It's a receptor protein. Now, when that receptor, uh, when that molecule binds to that receptor protein, something's going to happen. What happens is something called transduction. And that's when the signal is related through the cell membrane to the other side. Basically what it is, it's a shape change. The protein, the receptor protein, has a shape change, what we call a conformational shape change. That shape change, remember, as I always said, shape determines function. So when that shape change occurs, that's going to cause a reaction on the inside of the cell. And as you can see, the signal molecule never went through the cell membrane. It doesn't um, is the message. And the final thing is going to be response. Okay, response is basically something happens inside the cell. In our uh, telephone example, you know, you hang up the phone and you go do what you were told to do. That's what response is going to be. So let's talk a little bit more about these signal molecules. Are they? Uh, signal molecules are generally going to be uh, one of two classes. They're going to be proteins or they're going to be lipids, which are fats. And usually these lipids are uh, called steroids. And you might have heard of steroids. Okay, testosterone is one, estrogen is a steroid. Uh, you might have heard of anabolic steroids, the things that help build you up and things of that nature. These are all signal molecules, but they kind of have different, um, uh, they work in different ways. The proteins uh, are going to bind to a receptor protein outside on the cell's exterior surface. And let me just back up a little bit. Anything uh, that causes a, uh, that leads to this, this process of reception, transduction, response, any type of thing, molecule or it could be a, a, a um, an electrical signal it could be a noise it could be a vibration anything that causes this beginning of the signal pathway is known as a ligand l-i-g-a-n-d a ligand and in this case what we're looking at are is a protein that is embedded in the phospholipid bilayer and this is a receptor protein and here's a more of a cartoon uh, picture of it, and this is what it sort of looks like in real life. It's a series of these, series of these uh, what we call alpha helixes, and this is where the ligand is going to bind right here. Well, when the ligand binds right there, it's going to cause this shape change, and what's the shape change? There's this little loop on the inside of the cell that interacts with something we call a G protein, and when it does that, it's going to set off a series of reactions inside the cell. So the signal, the ligand, binds here, and then it's going to cause this little loop down here to change shape. And that is what we call transduction. Okay, again, a conformational shape change 
in the receptor protein is going to set off the transduction pathway. And once again, the ligand binds at the signal binding site, causing a conformational shape change, which will then set off a transductional transduction pathway. That's the end of part one. And you have put, I put a little diagram on the bottom of your notes there, uh, looking at reception, transduction, and response. Now let's go ahead and go into part two, which is looking a little bit more at these specific re receptor proteins. And we're going to talk about a couple of different ones. The first one we're going to talk about is the G-protein-linked receptor. And then we're going to talk about the tyrosine kinase pathway. We're going to talk about... All right, finally, intracellular receptors. Intra means within. These are receptor molecules that are not on the outside of the cell membrane, but they're actually on the inside. And they are uh, basically the target of steroid hormones because steroid hormones are fats. They can actually diffuse through the cell membrane. Uh, unlike proteins, uh, which cannot go through the cell membrane. So these intracellular receptors are going to be on the inside of the cell. So let's jump in and start off with our G-protein-linked receptor. Do pay attention to the G-protein-linked receptor. You might see it on a test. So let's uh, look at that one right now. We have reception, followed by reception, followed by transduction, followed by a response. And what turns off this system is when this uh, little GTP, again, re remember it stands, stands for guanine triphosphate, it's gonna lose one of those phosphate molecules and the GTP gets converted back to GDP and it goes back into its inactivated form. So that's the G protein system. Let's look at another one called a tyrosine kinase receptor. Now this one's kind of interesting and uh, because it can cause a really, really, really rapid response in the cell and in the organism. And if you look at it, like I said, structure determines function. This particular receptor protein, all it has to do is get two ligands, two signal molecules to bind to this. This comes together and there are six, at least six, uh, intracellular receptors inside the cell on this particular protein. This thing can set off six different pathways at once. So if your body really needs to have something happening really quick, generally it's going to be a tyrosine kinase receptor. And uh, this plays a huge role in... Um, in uh, any time there's uh, an, in emergent, emergency responses and if there's a bad injury to your body somehow, a bad cut or something like this, many of these tyrosine kinases receptors will kick in and do their job. And once again, what they're going to do is can set off up to you know, six to ten different pathways at one time, really super fast. The third type... Uh, was the intracellular receptor protein. The G protein and the tyrosine kinase receptors, remember the signal molecule or the ligand is going to dock onto those proteins outside the cell, on the exterior part of the cell. Well, on the intra, intra means inside or within, and the intracellular receptor protein, just look at it, it's inside the cell already. And this, the ligand, or the signal molecule, in this case it's testosterone, it's a lipid, it's a steroid. It can diffuse through the cell membrane. The proteins, they hit the cell membrane and they bounce off. They cannot go through, so they have to bind to a molecule on the outside, a protein receptor on the outside. These guys can diffuse down through the cell membrane and it'll, it'll dock onto a protein receptor within the cell and then this protein receptor is generally what it's going to do is it's going to initiate the transcription and translation of a gene to make proteins. That's their main job. They are going to uh, turn on a gene, basically. And uh, remember, you have genes inside every single one of your cells for eyeballs and liver cells and heart cells and all sorts of stuff. But those genes 
in your fingernails are turned off. If they weren't turned off, you'd have some issues going on. So uh, this is one of the ways in which the body can fine tune which genes are being turned on at which time is th are through these different types of receptor proteins. Amplified, okay, so just one molecule, signal molecule can come in and in a very short time cause literally thousands, maybe millions of different processes to get started at once. And that is the big point with this. And as you can see, uh, here's a signaling pathway. Here's our reception involving one molecule. In the process of transduction, okay, we go from one molecule to 100 molecules to 10,000 molecules to 100,000 molecules to a million molecules. And in the response, we're at close to a billion molecules. All right, so uh, this, is, this, re this is an amazingly quick and rapid response. And, uh, um, and that's the whole point about this process is amplification of the signal. You only need a small amount of the ligand or the signal molecule to create a massive, massive response. And I'm sure all of you have heard of the fight or flight response when like the little old lady goes out and picks up the car because her grandchild is underneath it and stuff. This is a result of one of these uh, um, cascade type reactions producing lots of um, uh, epinephrine and things of that nature. Well, that's it for today. Go over this notes. Hope you enjoyed it.